You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Everybody loves a sequel, especially when it comes to the world's most comfortable shoe. Introducing the Allbirds Wool Runner 2, a next level revamp of the cult classic. Seven years in the making, it's been completely reimagined for a game changing fit and feel. With enhanced cushioning and super soft materials, the Wool Runner 2 delivers comfy all day wear built for bliss. Visit Allbirds.com and use code FRESH24 to score a free pair of socks with purchase. That's A L L B I R D S dot com, code FRESH24. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 59, Anschluss Part 3, the February 1938 meeting. This week, a big thank you goes out to Scotty and Nicholas for choosing to support the podcast on Patreon where they get access to ad-free versions of all of the podcast episodes, plus special patron-only episodes released once a month, or roughly once a month. Head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more information. Also, I'd like to remind everybody that the best way to help spread the news of the podcast and for the podcast to find new listeners is you, either by leaving reviews on your podcast platform of choice or by just telling people about it. So if you could do that, you would have my eternal gratitude. Relations between Germany and Austria after 1933 were not always bad, and there was not always the impending threat of Germany forcefully absorbing the smaller nation. In fact, in July 1936, they would sign an agreement which stated that Germany would recognize the full sovereignty of the federal state of Austria, which was in line with what Hitler had stated during May 1935. The threat was always simmering under the surface, though, even if it was not always close to happening, because all that stood in Germany's way really, were the reactions of the other nations around the world and those within Germany. There was little possibility that if Germany really wanted to invade Austria, that Austria could stop them. Or as Goering would say to the director of security in Upper Austria, Count von Rivetera, in November 1937, quote, Do you really think that if the Führer wanted to force the Anschluss, Austria would be able to defend herself? I may as well tell you that this union will be carried out no matter what happens, for the Fuhrer is determined at all costs to settle the question, and nobody could protest. Austria would be the cultural and artistic center of the whole Reich, though the political leadership would obviously remain in Berlin. End quote. The Count would then write that Goering then went on to explain to me that history would pass severe judgment on those who felt compelled to oppose the future of the two German peoples. The concern that this possibility would turn into real action would be one that would drive domestic Austrian politics and relations with Germany during the mid and late 1930s. In this episode, we will look at some of the changes made to Austrian society during the Dolphus and Schuschenig regime before discussing a meeting that took place between Hitler and Schuschenig in in February 1938, which would set in motion the events that would eventually lead to the Anschluss later that year. During their years in power, the Dolphus government began to make changes to some pieces of Austrian society, and one of the best examples was in the area of education. In 1935, Schuschenig would state, quote, the road to the new state begins in schools. Obviously, a period of just four years was not enough for all of the changes that they wanted to be made to be completed, but it was enough for them to get started. Over the course of more than a year, the various school regulations were changed to allow for the shift and new textbooks were started, although they would take some time. The overall goal was to move towards a closer agreement with the new government, in a very similar way that the Nazi takeover in Germany and the fascist takeover of Italy were precursors to wide-ranging reforms of the education curriculum. The first major change was made in June 1933, when an agreement was signed with the Catholic Church that allowed the Church to regain much of the power that it had previously held over the creation of school policy in Austria. Much of this had been lost during the decade after the First World War, during which Catholic power was greatly reduced by the left-leaning Austrian governments. The key part of the agreement was that the Austrian school system 
would not teach anything that directly contradicted or undermined the Catholic religion in any way. Another major change was around how certain topics were taught in schools. History was taught in a very specific way, first to fall in line with the agreements with the Catholic Church, but also to glorify Austrian, and specifically Austrian history, to reinforce the idea that Austria should be an independent state. This was designed to counteract the previous focus on the German nature and German identity of Austria. Patriotic education was also added, which was justified by the following, quote, Patriotic education should awaken in students a love of their Austrian fatherland and lead them to willing and dutiful integration into the state community and to respect and follow the constitution and laws. A third change was the introduction of pre-military training for boys, while girls were enrolled in physical education to prepare them to be fit and healthy mothers. Even beyond education, the Catholic Church was a major part of the new government. Dolphus would even directly state this in September 1933, saying, quote, We will build up a Catholic German state, which will be thoroughly Austrian. This was a radical change from the previous government under the Social Democrats, which in no way outlawed or removed the church from Austrian society, but enacted many reforms that stripped it of its official power. When the Fatherland Front became the sole political party of Austria, it brought with it a Catholicism that was trumpeted as a bulwark against the anti-religious views from both the far left and the far right. It also dovetailed nicely with other government policies around large families, the glorification of motherhood, just as we have discussed previously on the podcast with Germany, Italy, and Spain. In Austria, the concerns were seen as even more acute, with Austria having the lowest birth rate in Europe after the First World War, due to a host of problems, including the harsh economic conditions of the new nation. To counteract this, stipends and financial rewards were provided to families with more than four children, and some social changes that occurred in the 1920s were attacked, including the rise of the number of women in the workforce. These efforts ran into one very real problem, though. There simply were not enough men to go around. The areas that made up the new nation of Austria suffered heavily in the First World War when it came to casualties at the front, and this meant that there were thousands of women that simply could not marry because there were no men available. Or, as was reported in one Austrian newspaper in 1936, quote, From a purely statistical point of view, 200,000 women in Vienna alone are forced to earn their living in reality, and there are many more. Despite all efforts to direct women back to the home, it remains a stark fact that hundreds of thousands of women in Austria must work outside the home. These type of gender role-based shifts were officially supported by the government and the church as part of a general program to push Austrian society as a whole towards a more traditional and conservative point that required sort of deprogramming a society that had become slightly more liberal in the years after 1918. Another topic I want to discuss around Austrian society was around public libraries. Now, I'll be honest here, there's not some sort of grand segue into this. I fell down a bit of a research rabbit hole one weekend, and I think this topic is interesting, and so we're going to have the next couple minutes of discussion. Also, if you are in an area with public libraries, support your public libraries. They are great, and this podcast would not be the same without mine. Anyway, in Austria in 1930s, public libraries were not free, but they were public in that they were open to anybody who could afford the relatively small fees that they charged. They were often ran by various groups, either political or religious, which did have a tendency to shift what they offered to their patrons. One of these groups, which opened many libraries, were the various leftist parties, and these were referred to as workers' libraries, which have a German name I'm not going to attempt. These were generally even more open, but they were then outlawed by the Dolphus government when the Social Democrat Party was outlawed. This resulted in the government taking possession of all of the libraries and all of the books, over 300,000 of them. When these libraries reopened under the government, their books were altered slightly, with around a quarter of them removed due to their contents. Dr. Karl Lugmeier would be put in charge of providing oversight to the libraries, both those directly controlled by the government and other groups. He would say, quote, Book selection will be tolerant, although in the beginning it must be applied a little more strictly if it is to be helpful in quieting the political uneasiness. There will be no Bolshevist literature in circulation, 
nothing anti-religious. At the same time, there was a sharp reduction in how much the libraries were actually used. Although it's possible that this was due not due strictly to the fact that books were removed or the books were different now, as other libraries around the world would have similar problems in the mid-1930s. While there were restrictions put in place by the new government, it stopped short of destroying or burning books which were outlawed, which would happen in Germany and other places. Instead, the books were simply removed from circulation. So this is your public library update, your Austrian public library update, which I acknowledge is a bit random and not necessarily super connected to the rest of this episode. Get ahead of postage rate increases this year with Stamps.com. It's like your own personal post office. Sign up with promo code PROGRAM for a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. That's Stamps.com code PROGRAM. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress, Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire, enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty, and about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today, and join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode, where I'd like to tell you a story. During the 1930s and in the run-up to the eventual Anschluss, one of the hidden changes in European politics was the relationship between Germany, Italy, and Austria. In the years after the First World War, Italy had been a big supporter of Austrian independence and a backer for its continuation. This was due to Italian concerns that a stronger Austria, or the presence of Germany on its northern borders, would put some of the territory gained by Italy after the First World War at risk. This was a well-understood relationship between all three nations. But then Italy and Germany, and particularly their leaders, grew closer together, removing that block from German expansion. Along with this shift, within Austria, there were also attempts by Schuschnigg to reach out to prominent leaders of the Austrian Nazi party in the hopes that they could be brought into support of the government. The hope was that this would make the government stronger, while also making relations with Germany far better, which was always a concern. But then the exact opposite would happen. When it became clear to Schuschnigg and the government that many of the Austrian Nazi leaders were far too radical, or as they would say, bomb-throwing, the result would be that many were arrested. The removal of several prominent Austrian Nazis allowed one of their seemingly more moderate members to take center stage. The leading person that would take advantage of this was Arthur Seiss Inquart. Seiss Inquart was a young Viennese lawyer and would be a critical player in the last months of independent Austria. He would occupy this position because Sushinig began to work closely with him in order to come to an agreement, under the assumption that such an agreement would make things easier during the inevitable conversations with Hitler, a conversation that Sushinig would be invited to on January 26th. There were two major problems with the idea of working with Seisenquart. The first was that it was based on the assumption that Seisenquart was a loyal Austrian who wanted to continue Austrian independence. The second was that conversations between Schuschnigg and Seisenquart, which were designed to be secret, would remain private. In the case of Seisenquart's loyalty, it was questionable at best, and even if he saw himself as an Austrian patriot, his actions would have results that were far from patriotic, something that will be a theme for the next episode. Part of these actions were to make the negotiations far from secret, and the agreement that was reached, called the Little Program, would be known to Hitler before any conversations with Sushnig took place. The program had ten items that the government was willing to concede, and to Seisenquart and the Austrian Nazis. Most of these were quite small and, and minor, the release of political prisoners from years before, for example. But some of them were more important. For example, the seventh would state that, quote, 
There are certainly some important basic concepts of the non-party-bound national socialism which can be organically incorporated into the political ideology of the new Austria, end quote. So basically it's saying here that the Fatherland Front, or the official party of Austria, could absorb some ideas from national socialism. The negotiations which saw the creation of the little program were actually going quite slowly before the invitation to meet with Hitler arrived. This invitation caused Sushenig to push for their completion. He would later say, quote, When the invitation to Berchtesgaden became imminent, I pressed for the conclusion of these domestic political talks in order to get a basis for negotiations at Berchtesgaden, or rather in order to be able to show Hitler that we have already on our own accord made the maximum internal concessions possible and were therefore not able to pay any higher price, end quote. They would be completed less than a day before Schuschenig traveled to Germany, which gave Seiss and Quart exactly what he wanted, just enough time to transmit them to Germany to prepare Hitler and others for the meetings without Schuschenig's knowledge. The meeting between Schuschenig and Hitler would occur on February 12th. He was accompanied by the state secretary of the foreign minister and his adjutant. Before leaving Vienna, he would make a point to mention to the mayor of Vienna that sh- he should take control of the government if Schuschenig did not return. Those were kind of the expectations. Now, they seemed pretty negative, but Franz von Papen had informed Schuschenig that, quote, the worst that can happen is that after the meeting, we are exactly where we are today. The Fuhrer told me so himself. Uh, Papen is pretty much outright lying uh, in that quote. One thing that has to be noted when discussing the meeting that was to follow is that we are pretty limited when it comes to the information that we have about it, especially the first meeting where it was just Hitler and Schuschenig. This is because the two men, Hitler and Schuschenig, did not require an interpreter, and this reduced the number of people who were actually required to attend. This means that we only have Schuschenig's notes on the discussions that would occur. We are left with a one-sided portrayal of events, but most of what Schuschenig discusses in his notes about the meeting do quite closely mirror the types of behaviors and discussions that are far better documented during the Munich crisis a few months later. Hitler's using kind of the same wording, the same way of delivery, um, the sort of the same way of delivering threats. In both meetings, Hitler would take a very similar stance, whereby he would take an agreement that had already been made and then demand much more. For this meeting, the previous agreement had been provided by Seiss and Quart, the, and Hitler seized upon these positions as his basis for negotiations and pushed much further in his demands. The entire conversation would see Hitler move over to the attack almost immediately. Hitler would say, Austria has, anyway, never done anything with which to help the German Reich. Her whole history is one uninterrupted act of treason to the race. That was just as true in the past as it is today. With Schuschenig responding, quote, as we, Austria, see it, the whole of our history is a very essential and valuable part of Germany, German history, which just cannot be wished away with the overall German picture. One of the common situations in these types of meetings would be Hitler complaining, but not really making concrete demands, as he did not want to confine himself to concrete action items. This would cause Schuschenig to eventually say, quote, We simply have to go on living aside one another and the little state next to the big one. We have no other choice. And that is why I ask you to tell me what your concrete complaints are, end quote. But Hitler would continue to dodge providing a simple list, stating, quote, I am telling you that I intend to clear up the whole of this so-called Austrian question one way or the other, end quote. Eventually, the meeting would just end without a real conclusion. Instead, Schuschenig would later be handed a document with 10 points that he was expected to sign that what it contained was simply the little program, which had been the previous agreement, but greatly inflated. For example, there was a demand for a pro-Nazi war minister and minister of the interior to be brought into the Austrian cabinet. After a short break during which the documents were given to Schuschenig, another meeting was held, and the conversation would not be greatly different than before. There were more demands and more arguing. The demand that Schuschenig appoint a minister of the interior from the Nazi party, with Seiss and Kort being directly recommended, was a direct mirror of Hitler's demand back in 1933 that he be allowed to place his own choice as Minister of the Interior when the Nazi party was outnumbered in the German cabinet um, all those years ago. The reasoning was the same. It would give Seiss and Kort a huge amount of power around public security and all of the police in Austria, 
Papen, who was present, would try and convince Schuschnigg to give in to the demands, saying, quote, from that time on, Germany would remain loyal to this agreement and that there would be no further difficulties for Austria, end quote. The initial goal for Hitler was to get Schuschnigg to sign the document immediately, which he, he would eventually do, but only after making it very clear that the signature was essentially worthless, as such a document had to be signed by the Austrian president, who was back in Vienna. Hitler was displeased by this, to say the least, which would prompt Hitler to begin obliquely threatening an invasion, which also activated a, a bit of theater that he had set up beforehand. Before the second meeting had started, Hitler had set up a bit of theater with General Keitel, the head of the OKW, and had told him that he would be called in during the meeting. And when Hitler would do this, it would cause Sushinig to say, quote, I am fully aware that you can invade Austria, whether we like it or not, and that would mean bloodshed. We are not alone in this world, and such a step would probably mean war, end quote. After signing the document, Sushinig de- declined to stay for dinner and left. The entire Keitel situation was a big bluff, with Hitler staging his appearance like he was willing and able to order an immediate invasion of Austria, but nothing of the sort was planned. And instead, he told Keitel that he was simply there to show up in the meeting, and he would not even have to say a word, it's just his presence was enough. Even though the document was signed, because Schuschnigg's signature was worthless, the Austrian government was given three days to officially sign it, and the next three days were full of argument but eventually they would give in to the demands. Seissen Court was given the position of Minister of the Interior as part of a much wider shakeup in the cabinet. Schuschnigg was allowed to bring in people he could trust, and a Social Democrat leader was even brought in as the Secretary of Labor. It was the closest thing to a government of national unification that Austria would ever have during the interwar period, but it was too late, and it would not last very long. After the meeting and the acquiescence of the Austrian government, Hitler was very pleased and the situation seemed to be developing nicely. But publicly, he was back to his public declarations of peace, stating before the Reichstag on February 20th that, quote, I express before the German people my sincere thanks to the Austrian Chancellor for his great understanding and the warm-hearted willingness with which he accepted my invitation and worked with me, so that we might discover a way of serving the best interest of the two countries, end quote. Within Austria, at least from the perspective of Schuschnigg and the government, things were deteriorating rapidly. Seissen Quart, the new minister of the interior, was having Hitler's intended impact on society. The police force became borderline non-functional when it came to keeping the peace. In the areas of strong Nazi support near the German border, there was essentially a state of civil war, with very little ability of the central government to exercise any real control. Schuschnigg finally began to understand the problems he was facing, and he would write that, quote, every concession on our part brought an avalanche of new and impossible demands. Because of this feeling of helplessness, on March 9th, while addressing a large crowd in Innsbruck, Schuschnigg would announce that on March 13th, the entirety of Austria would hold a plebiscite. The question to be asked was if the people supported Austrian independence. The wording was important, though, with the people being asked, quote, if they supported a free and German independent and social Christian and united Austria, for freedom and work, and for the equality of all who declare for race and fatherland, end quote. This put the Germans in a bit of a hard spot. For a long time, they had been advocating for a plebiscite regarding a union with Germany, all the way back to 1919. But now it was different, because instead of a straightforward question about joining Germany, it was instead asking a question that was worded in a way that for the people to vote no, would basically be to reject so much of what people felt their nation stood for. To even further move the balance towards this desired result, Schuschnigg would essentially enact things that the German Nazis had done in all of the German elections after they'd taken power. The voting rolls were not updated and had not been since 1930, which reduced the number of young people who could vote, which would hurt Nazi support. Then voting stations were only supplied with ballots that had a yes pre-printed on them, with any no votes having to be placed on paper provided by the voter. Seissen Court was able to push back against some of this blatant manipulation, but it did little to address the larger concern that the Nazi leaders in Germany and in Austria had. They felt that the vote was rigged and was incredibly unlikely to go in their favor. Around the time that the plebiscite was in the planning stages, Seissen Court was starting to get some real cold feet and had started to work closer with the government in planning and supporting the plebiscite. He had moved so far in that direction that there were other, more pro-German Austrian Nazi leaders that had started to move around Seissen Court and work directly with the Germans. 
This meant that when the plebiscite was announced, the German leaders were already informed, but not from Seiss and Quart, which did nothing to help his credibility in the eyes of the German leaders. News of the plebiscite pushed the possibility of a German military invasion of Austria up to another level. The precise plans for such an action were amorphous at best. In fact, the German military leadership was quite unprepared. Hitler would order Keitel to present the military's plans for the invasion, with Keitel going to General Beck, the chief of the army general staff, and saying, quote, The Fuhrer requires you to report to him immediately on the dispositions made for the Wehrmacht to enter Austria. The only plans that had been prepared were from back in June 1937, at which point some basic outlines had been drawn up for Plan Otto, with the scenario not being the annexation of Austria into Germany, but instead the prevention of the restoration of a Habsburg dynasty. This was obviously a very different scenario than what the Germans were walking into in 1938. With such disappointing preparations for an invasion, Beck was forced to report that the army was not prepared for the operation, with Hitler ordering him to begin work on them immediately. The requirement was that they should be structured so that the troops would be in position to create the impression that they could act as peaceful liberators, not brutal invaders. There was also a very tight timeline, because all of the planning had to be done, all the troops had to be in position, and the invasion had to be launched no later than midday on March 12th, the day before the plebiscite. Shushinig, in his desire to kind of solve the matter once and for all with the plebiscite, had put a time frame on when German intervention had to happen, and the Fuhrer and Hitler and, and the Germans were ready to go for it. No matter what was about to happen, it was all going to happen before March 13th. And it actually would, which we will discuss next episode. <laughs> 